so Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who live therein. For he has found it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol. Sometimes my NIV will slip in here. That's how I have it memorized. So <laughs> forgive me. And sometimes I like the NIV better, so that's what we'll do here. We'll, we'll do both translations. <laughs> or swear by what is false. He'll receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Mm -hmm. Who is this King of glory? Oh, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Amen. Lord, mighty in battle. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Lord, help us understand glory. Help us understand you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I stand before you today, probably like you sit before me today, and that is as an individual that wouldn't mind losing some weight. Uh, it's after Christmas. I eat too much. It's, uh, it's impossible not to eat too much in my wife's house. Uh, she's not easy on uh, the waist size during Christmas. So she has all these things always set out. And uh, I just decide, you know, December's the month where I just don't care. And I don't care much any time. I just decide on that month I don't care. So here we go. We eat up. And I'll typically gain anywhere from literally 15 to 20 pounds during December. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, so I'm back at it now, trying to lift weights and, and uh, do aerobic exercise and trying to lose weight. But I'm thinking to myself, if I want to be holy, if I want to be like the Lord, maybe I ought to be thinking about gaining more weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have to remind you that in the Hebrew cognate here for the word glory, it actually means weight. Heavy. So we talk about the king of glory, you're talking about the king of somebody who weighs a lot, who is substantial, who is bulky. And I'm thinking... All right, amen. I like that. I can, I can deal with that. So uh, maybe I'll save the weight loss for July and uh, continue to try to get a little bit heavier here. Interesting about this particular song, uh, the church has used it uh, after the Resurrection Sunday for ascension. Uh, and, and I think they do that largely because of verse 3. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? There's the word. And so let's use it for ascension Sunday. Uh, I don't think it's quite appropriate for that, but still, it's... It's historically used for that, and I like it. Uh, it is thought to have been used to bring the ark to Jerusalem. As David brought the ark to Jerusalem. We're talking about going to a special place, and God's special presence will be in that special place. And I like that, because I think it becomes an evangelistic hymn at that point, that God has special places in human hearts where he wants to move into. And the king of glory, with the cooperation of evangelists all around the world, want to go on into those human hearts. So I like that. However, Dalich says something that I think is quite interesting, and uh, I really got turned on about this about a month ago. And that was, this is an Advent song. I like that. Because it has four great questions. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? The answer is Jesus. <laughs> Who may stand in His holy place? The answer is Jesus. Third question, who is this king of glory? It's Jesus. Who is this king of glory? Fourth question, the answer is it's Jesus. And then, of course, Jesus says, I want you to follow me. And so as I'm looking down at this, I'm thinking, well, let's gain some weight. And weight's not a bad idea, even in the New Testament. Uh, I keep running across this Pauline phrase, live a life worthy of your calling, or live a life worthy of the gospel. He uses it four or five times. And I'm thinking, uh, let me do a little Bible study on that. And as I dug into it, I found the Greek word axios, which is actually kind of a balanced term. It was a scale term. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, here is the gospel. And, uh, and Paul's saying, you need to live a life worthy of this weighty thing called the gospel, or this call on your life, or this doctrine of the first half of the book in a place like Ephesians. Live that kind of life. How do you do that? Only with the heaviness of God, the glory of God, can that ever happen. 
the glory of God, the weight of God, the substantialness of holiness come to rest upon your life? Can you ever live a life worthy of anything concerning God? And so I'm thinking, Lord, I want that weight. I want to gain some weight. Amen. How do I gain weight? And uh, the answers are right here. It's there in verse 3 and 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? Beautiful list of four things. He who has clean hands. He who has a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear deceitfully. Swear by what is false. But real quickly. We could have a Bible study and we could throw this question out for you today and you could answer better than I could. But I, I like these four things. First off, he who has clean hands. Now, I said something uh, years ago at one of the camp meetings. I've only done probably two in my life. But I was at a camp meeting where we had a grand total of eight people listening to my sermon uh, one hot afternoon, about 105 degrees. I'm thinking to myself, by the way, that's why I've only done two in my life. I thought, if this is what they're like, I ain't never going back. I don't. So here we are, preaching eight people, and, and one of them was Steve Lakemore. So there, there were two evangelists and six people at this camp meeting. Um, and he said something to me that I had said that's always kind of been meaningful just because he said, I, I appreciate what you said that day. And I don't even remember saying it, but the, the clean hands part. Our hands are cleansed, so our tradition has taught us, by what we don't do. You know, the old funny phrase, we don't smoke, dance, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do, we just don't do some things. Holiness calls us not to do some things. And by the way, I absolutely agree with that. But if that is the accent of your life, you're going to turn off not only God, you're going to turn off your neighbors. You're going to majorly turn off the unevangelized. They don't want to see a life that is basically understood as, I don't do that. I'm reminded of uh, Keith Miller who once said, you know, he, was, he had a, a sermon illustration that dealt with Gandhi. Someone came up to him afterwards and said, you know, Gandhi's, Gandhi's in hell today. And Keith Miller says, you know, I don't want to live my life as someone who picks out the bubbles out of other people's champagne. We don't do Gandhi. Well, okay. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. And too many of us go around saying what we don't do. And we judge other people by what they do do versus what we don't do. And we can't do that. Amen, bro. If God's called you that, I love what A.W. Tozer said. If God has said you don't do something, it doesn't mean that's a template for everybody else. It means it's a template for you and he wants to take you deeper. So don't say, hey, everybody else has to do what God's called me to do. He's called you to do it, so let him deal with you specifically. And by the way, having understood that, I don't mind going to a church and saying, and by the way, we don't drink, and here's why. But the accent of our church life isn't that we don't drink, it's that we're drunk with the Spirit. Amen. 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 That's good. So I, I, I just want to be that kind of guy. Amen. It says, let's, let's, well, let's get back to clean hands. I don't think our hands are cleansed by what we don't do nearly as much as by what we place our hands to. Hmm. I think it's kind of like a, most things. You know, you, you don't want to fly in a jet plane that hadn't been used for the last 50 years. Okay. I want one that actually had a pretty good track record yesterday. <laughs> and I think clean hands are a lot like that too. How are our hands cleansed? Not by what we don't do nearly so much as by what we do do. What we put our hands to. I, uh, I'm no great fan of John Piper. In fact, I'm a non-fan. I, I haven't liked the swipes he's taken in our tradition, to be honest. Uh, I got to be pretty good. But never had just a whole lot of affection for him, so I kind of put John Piper over here. But uh, I read something today before yesterday. I have a dear friend that lived in this community and actually uh, led the Veritas School. He used to meet down in our basement here. And uh, Joe Maxwell wrote an article 20 years ago called The Silence of the Shepherds. And he said, you know, it's really interesting that nobody that's a big timer in this nation who regards himself as a great Bible teacher and stuff you can go get down at the Lifeway bookstore, they don't ever say anything about abortion. About the major atrocity of our age, they don't say anything about it. And he said, the silence of the shepherds. It's shameful. And I read that, and I was ashamed. I read it 20 years ago. I read it when it came out. I thought, I'm ashamed of our evangelical culture. 
Billy Graham doesn't want to say anything about it. John MacArthur didn't want to say anything about it. I mean, you just list the pastors. They don't want to talk about it. John Piper was one of those pastors. He said, I'm sitting in a restaurant one day with my wife. We are watching TV, and all of a sudden, a pro-life uh, rally came on. He said, I looked up at that. In, in our language, we would say the Holy Spirit all of a sudden began to move. He didn't say that. He just looked at it and says, and I thought to myself, they're right. They're right. Then he says, by God's mercy, the Lord started showing me the gaps in my life. He says, so I started going back to my church and I saying, we're taking a stand. He says, and I preach on it at least twice a year now. He said, what's also interesting is, like Gary Copro, I've been arrested. <laughs> going out to an abortion clinic. Taking a stand. He says, I'm not ashamed of it. Then all of a sudden, his church began flourishing with pro-life ministries. Because he's basically saying, I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to say, follow me. And let's let to see what God can do with this congregation. Now I would say, Bethlehem Church at that point, of social action, of social justice, of taking a stand on the most consequential social issue of our day, said, we decide for clean hands. We're voting in favor of them. Not by what we say. Not by what we don't do, but more importantly, by what we do do. It's quite interesting. You know, Eric, we get a judge to see the judgment seat of Christ. All the things that we deem really important, what we don't do, we aren't talked about a whole lot. What we do do, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was in prison, you visited me. I was sick, you came to me. Interesting stuff. It's what you do do. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Pure heart's an interesting one as well. Boy, we love the whole understanding of purity in our tradition. I love what Kierkegaard said. He, he actually wrote a book one day. The pure, purity of heart means to will one thing. That's challenging, isn't it? What's the one thing I will in my life? Gary, do you have a problem with this? You keep thinking, you know, about 10 years ago, no, that was 20, no, that was about 35 years ago. I, I do that all the time now when I remember things. 30, 35 years ago, I was in a, uh, a house uh, at Asbury Seminary, and it was the house of Al Koppich. He was discipling a group of young men. We're all sitting there, and uh, he opens up Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Al didn't do this a lot, but that night he did. He kind of, kind of turned it over to us. He says, what do you guys think about this uh, passage? And, uh, I put my hand right up. I don't mind being counterintuitive. I said, I don't like it. And uh, you all said, well, what do you mean? You don't like it. So I don't, I don't like it. i, I got to tell you, I'm uncomfortable with seek ye first because it seems to me that if you look at that word first, that it go ahead, goes ahead to imply that there's a second, third, and fourth. And so seek ye first. I know all kinds of Christians that seek ye first. Right? On Sunday, we go to church. First thing of the week, we go to church. We tie with the first of our income. But on Monday through Saturday, we're going to do the second, third, and fourth things. Mm -hmm. so I don't really like the past. We all laughed at me. That wasn't that normal for that group. <laughs> About a year later, I was in Lawrence, Kansas. Now, in the meantime, I had an Aunt Alita who bought me a series of, uh, of Greek word commentaries called uh, Kittles. Yeah, you know about them? They're purple, about 13 volumes. So I got those over there. And occasionally I'll stand up from my easy chair and go look up a word. And I'm looking at this passage, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and I still don't like it. So I decided, well, fine, I'm, I'm going to go look up the word first. So I go look up the word first. Do you know what it is? Proton. Proton. So I, I look it up and open it up and seek it. And you know what proton means in the Greek? It means before two. Before three. Three before four. I mean, it's almost like the commentary is saying, you eat it? What, what are you looking this up for? It means first, for crying out loud. Some things are easily understood. It means first. I'm about ready to slam it shut, but I turned the last page. 
And I wish I had it today. I'll go run them off to get The last paragraph said this. Everywhere else in Scripture, it means first. But not here. When you see the context of Jesus' ministry, it could only be understood to mean... I did a sermon series one time on how do you spell relief? Remember that? R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Some of you guys are yeah. old enough to remember that. Yeah. How do you spell relief? Well, I said, how do you spell Christianity? And my first spelling was O-N-L-Y. It says, everywhere else in Scripture, proton is first, but not here. Here, it can only be understood to mean, see ye only the kingdom of God. Or he said, above all. And above all really helped me. Because I know enough about uh, Roman numeral number one, Roman numeral number two. Y'all know about the Roman numeral number system when, you, when you're in school and they told you, go ahead and outline this passage. And so you say, Roman numeral number one. And here's the point. Everything underneath Roman numeral number one is supposed to support Roman numeral number one. Right? Roman numeral number one. The king and his kingdom. A, your money. B, your family. C, your job. Go ahead and list them. But here's the point. There is no Roman numeral number two. <laughs> everything is subsumed. Everything supports. Everything is brought to submission to Roman numeral number one. See ye only the kingdom of God. And that's what pure heart means. At the end of the day, everything we do is about the king and his kingdom. And if it's not there yet, then that's what we believe about sanctification. We believe that it can be subsumed under the Roman numeral number one called the king and his kingdom. Amen. And so, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Now, this whole idol thing is interesting to me because I'm always looking at my life saying, do I have one? And I think we can fool ourselves in thinking we don't have them in our life. Well, we don't have the temptation to have them in our life. And uh, this is how I know. Mister, I'm talking to you and me right now, okay? Yes, sir. We've got favorite basketball teams going. <laughs> Mine were also the other night. <laughs> and I rejoice in that. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard when we were on this trip to, uh, to, to uh, Kenya not to get up in the middle of the night and say, they lost. Their team, they lost. Because <laughs> I was up checking. And I've got to ask this question about my life. By the way, we watched the Final Four game. We watched the championship game. Remember that, Steve? Watched the championship game in this room. Maybe not all of you invited to remember that. But those of us who were, we were watching the championship. Kansas versus whoever. Doesn't matter who it was. We, we, we beat them. How much attention do I give to Kansas basketball compared to the Word of God? Hey, for instance, I don't think you always have to add things up like that. But it's an interesting question for me. How much attention do I give the sports page to Kansas basketball? To making sure that because Indianapolis got rid of Peyton Manning, that they lost and now the Denver Broncos will win. How much attention, how much time do I give to these considerations versus how much time do I spend in prayer? How much time do I spend in Bible study? How much time do I spend down in a place like an abortion clinic standing up for life? How much time do I spend out in prison preaching the Word of God? How much time? Now, I don't, again, think that's necessarily a great way to always add up a life. But I've got to ask the question for me because I've learned this. It's probably about 20 years ago. Kansas lost the national championship game. And I was emotionally involved with that moment for a month after it happened. I felt sick about it. I can't believe we lost. Somewhere about 28 to 29 to 30 days after, I'm thinking, man, you need to grow up. <laughs> this is a game. It's almost like the Lord said, let me talk to you about Kansas basketball, Matt. It's a game. It's a stupid one. <laughs> Think about it. Dribble, dribble, dribble. Pass, pass, pass. Put it into a peach basket. I mean, it's a dumb game. It was meant, you know why it was invented? The guy coached the Kansas, the, the, the guy, by the way, the only losing coach Kansas ever had was James Naismith, who coached. He was our first coach in basketball back at, back at Kansas University. By the way, a chaplain, a holy man of God, 
we love Jesus. I think he looked at basketball today and weep for what has become. We basically asked these guys to come on, come on campus. None of them from Kansas. It's not a Kansas basketball team. I'm getting to be an American basketball team. We'll go anywhere to get the best talent possible to come back and get the Kansas alumni like freedom and excited. So they'll send in money. So they'll come to our games. So they'll make sure they tune us in. So they'll spend all kinds of emotional energy on something so inane and so stupid and so worthless as basketball. And it is worthless. Not American dollars. In the kingdom of God. And somebody's going to say something like, well, you know, you learn lessons out on the football field that you can't learn anywhere else. Character lessons. I like what Bodie Bauckham says about that. It's such a great place to learn character lessons that the NFL would be the holiest place yeah. in the world. <laughs> wow. Now that's me. Stupid thing. Used to be an athlete. Kind of hang on to that a little bit. What's it with you? What is there? Now, you think, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a holy guy. How about this? You get to where you really want to publish books. And all of a sudden, the publication of books becomes an idol. Yeah. But you think, no, these are Christian books. They'll help people. Yeah. Well, check your heart on that. Mm -hmm. Publication of books. Holy books. Good books can become an idol. Mm -hmm. Or, to be able to say, I've had people say this. Uh, Matt? You're the most pro-life pastor in this state. You're the most pro-life church in this state. And I'm starting to think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my pro-life activity becomes an idol mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Something that's just supposed to be holy, humble, simple, all of a sudden becomes, yeah. And then guess what happens? Then something winds into my heart and I start asking the question, yeah, and I'm involved, and I'm holy, and you're not involved, which must mean you're unholy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Seductive, isn't it? Well, you say, no, revival services. And, and a full altar. I think a full altar could be an idol. I've heard of evangelists yes. not talk about anything other than a full altar. Right. Almost like that's vindication for my existence. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. It's dangerous. Or swear by what? is false. Meaning what? I tell you what, there's a lot of falsity out there, isn't there? Yes, yes, yes. And I believe counterintuitively it's not just what you swear by, it's not just by what you commit to, it's not just by what you say, but also by what you don't commit to, what you don't swear by, and what you don't say. Mm -hmm. That could be just as false as what you do say. Now, I'm going to wrap up, get down. I think this one of the reasons this is a great Advent psalm as you get down to verse 8, who is this King of glory? The answer there is Jesus. Mm -hmm. yes. But who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Mm -hmm. And I love this whole thing of uh, Isaiah. You know, it talks about the, in, in Psalm 50, uh, excuse me, in Isaiah 53, you know, mm -hmm. let, let's see God's strong right arm. Let's, let's go ahead and roll the sleeves up and see His right arm. You find out it's a little baby in a manger. Way in the shadows of the fortress palace of Herod. He says, boy, look at this little anemic right arm. That's one way to look at it. We need to look at it that way. Another way to look at it is, when Jesus lands on planet Earth, He's mighty in battle. The fight is on. <laughs> like it's never been on before. And by the way, I don't think it's as intense as it's going to get. Because Jesus sends on the Spirit. So here comes the Spirit. And I think it reaches its greatest intensity. I think the battle reaches its greatest intensity on Pentecost Sunday. And on Pentecost, there we go. And the fight is on in a major way. And that's what makes Satan nervous. Mm -hmm. By the way, I think we ought to make a whole lot more out of Pentecost Sunday. We don't do anything with it. I think the biggest danger, we try to make it in our church. Not Christmas, not Easter. We make the biggest day in our church Pentecost. The coming of the Spirit. On one side of Pentecost, not a lot has changed in human imagination. Not a lot has changed, actually, in the lives of these so-called saints. After Pentecost Sunday, they changed the world. 
I think we ought to make a big deal out of Pentecost Sunday. The fight is on. Jesus comes. The battle is here. And now, I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. Enemy occupied territory. That's what his world is. The story of Christianity is how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise. <coughs> and now, wants us to join him in a great campaign of holy sabotage. <laughs> Isn't that great? Because I love this thought. We are in a civil war. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The civil war starts, and guess what? We're all of a sudden starting to divide the world up. But this is what that great theologian from Amsterdam said. He said, at the end of the day, every square inch of this room, every square inch of your body, every square inch of the Jackson metro area, every square inch of this world has been claimed and counterclaimed by the devil and by God. By God and the devil. And the fight's on. And the most precious thing on this globe are the souls of men. And that's what the fight is about. That's what Advent is about. Frankly, that's what Ascension Sunday was about. And that's what the ark finally coming into Jerusalem was all about too. The fight is on. And Advent becomes this. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Jesus. Who shall stand in this holy place? Jesus. Who is His King of glory? Jesus. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. It's Jesus. And now, the fight's on. And Jesus says, follow me. Let's go get bloody. That won't just be spiritual blood we're talking about. All over the world today, folks are getting bloody in the fight. May we have it, guys, given to us by the grace of God. If you want to give one to Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're a heavy God. But that heaven has come all over us. Grant it, Lord God. In the precious name of Jesus, the King of glory, we pray. Amen. Amen.